Hey, welcome back to the Growth and Scaling Podcast. This is the host, Todd Westra, and I am so glad that you are here today. This is a special episode. We have got an interview guest today who not only is doing an amazing job transitioning from doctor to business founder, but also doing an amazing job of tackling one of the hardest things in business to do, and that is having multiple targets that you're trying to connect into your product. A lot of people either are a B2C or a B2B client acquisition model. This particular case is super complicated. He's not only trying to do a B2B play, but also a B2C and a B2B to B. What does that mean? Well, you'll find out. (laughs) This interview is amazing. Uh, This business owner is a doctor of oncology and he is a specialist in cancer. That's what that means to be an oncologist is someone who deals with cancer. It's not the doctor everyone loves to see the most because it's usually the doctor that is dealing with a very life-threatening situation. Uh, We love them. We love to to see them, but we don't want to be their patient very often. (laughs) So, This interview is is particularly touching to me because I have had a lot of cancer in my family, and I know that many of you listening have had the same situation in yours. So this particular business model is exciting to me because he's not only growing and scaling a business that is servicing people with cancer, but he's also connecting the dots between those with cancer, people that are offering clinical studies, and doctors who refer people to get the clinical studies. So it's a three-tier client acquisition model for him, which is not an easy thing to tackle, but listen to how well he handles it. This is a fascinating interview. It's one that I uh, thoroughly enjoyed doing. And I know that for you who may have uh, uh, friends and family who who have gone through cancer, cancer treatments, maybe they passed away, maybe they, they overcame it. No matter how you're associated with cancer, this is gonna be an interesting interview for you. And those of you that are dealing with a client acquisition model where you're going after more than one type of model, more than one type of uh, client, this is a great interview. A lot of great insights. So I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you, I'm glad you're here on the Growth and Scaling Podcast. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the Growth and Scaling Podcast. This is your host, Todd Westra. And I am so glad you're here today because we are going to interview an amazing founder or executive who is gonna share with us their decisions that they made that exploded their growth. So if you need some inspiration, you wanna hear how other businesses are doing it, this is a place to be and we are glad you're here. Enjoy this episode. Hey, welcome back to the another episode of the Growth and Scaling Podcast. Today we have got an amazing doctor on board who, yes, a doctor, someone who actually has been to school way longer than I have, way more educated than I am, and he has been able to translate his knowledge into a way to help other people in a business of his own, which I absolutely love. Dr. Arturo, will you please tell us who you are and what kind of problem do you solve in your business? Well, thank you so much, Todd, for having me uh, today. Uh, So yeah, I'm Arturo Loiza Bonilla. I'm a medical oncologist and I'm the co-founder, chief medical officer of Massive Bio. Uh, So Massive Bio is an AI-enabled clinical trial matching solution for patients with cancer, uh, where we are helping as many patients as possible, no matter where they are in their cancer journey or in the treatment journey, to find the best options for their care. Um, All this coming from my personal experience with cancer in my family and with my patients, uh, and also the other co-founders had the same situations where they found themselves in a, in, in a need of information, a need of someone to actually help them to connect those dots. So, um, right. so we, we had been, you know, working on this mission for now uh, seven years uh, and, you know, growing wow. every single day. So that, nice to be here and talk about uh, it even more. I love it. I love it. So seven years. Yeah. Have you have you stopped your practice? Or are you still operating as an oncologist? I still practice. Uh, you know, uh, something that I learned, I, I, you know, along the way is that if you get completely out of the field, then you really lose sight of what's important, right? So you start making the you know the juiceros of the world uh, for clinical trials. So right. you need to really have the pain points in front of you, talking to patients, be myself an investigator, still taking care of patients in clinical trials. 
I need to know what's what's right. happening, what's changing, and it's really giving me a lot of intelligence. So even though I'm 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 not full time、yeah. practicing, I still have you know a, a, a visibility on that. Awesome. That that's so smart. It's so smart. And with with medicine, you know, I tease my father in law all the time.、Uh, he's he's a neonatologist, and he,、uh, you know, he's still practicing. He tells me all the time, "I'm still practicing. I, I I've not figured it out yet. I'm still trying to figure it out." And to your point, you know, you being able to、uh, continually learn and keep in front of your face at all times the pain point you're trying to solve, I think it's just going to make a better business for yourself. So I, I applaud you for doing that. It's awesome. How did you make the jump, though? I mean, seven years of of operating this this, and tell us exactly what it is. There's an app. There's a there's a connection between people putting on the studies. You've got people with cancer who are like, tell us how this client journey works. So what are you solving, and how do you do this? Right. So the the big problem we're solving is so just imagine right now in the last decade. 12 million patients were diagnosed with cancer, and out of those,、wow. 0.1 percent of those patients were offered a clinical trial for the, during the cancer journey. 0.1 percent. 0.1. And that 0.1 percent lived longer and had better outcomes than the 99.9 percent of patients who never got into a clinical trial. So that's the first part. That's heartbreaking. The other side. That's heartbreaking. The other side is. The oncology industry on the on the research and development side, they have plenty of clinical trials, but half of them are closing because there's no approval. That means that there is a real disconnect. There is some there was something missing that was trying to connect the patients and the sites with research and the pharma you know pharmacy industry coming together. So we、right. just realized that you know this is an opportunity for us to use technology at scale、uh, to help not just one patient in front of me but many more. Uh, in having the you know the experience myself as an oncologist, that I really didn't have the time. I want to help my patients no matter no matter what. That you know, you, I got into medicine because of I have a mission、right. and an interest. But it, there's just not enough time in the day and to do things that are sometimes menial in terms of like getting the right clinical trial in front of you. Is the insurance working for you? Is the、uh, the right treatment right now for you? Do you have the right biomarker?、Uh, is the trial open? Uh, like all those things that could be solved by technology、right. and making it streamlined,、uh, but doing it very patient centric, so you are the one empowered with、right. that information. So、um, the 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 move from you know I was actually in academia、uh, at the time, where you know in this amazing place that had all these resources, and still many of my patients came last you know last mile almost like you know they were. You know, heavily treated before they never got exposed to a clinical trial、right. option, and even in my institution, we didn't have a system to screen patients, even if they had all the opportunities to do so. So,、uh, we said, you know,、uh, this is a chance for us to really develop a,、uh, some form of solution that、uh, is patient centric.、Right. That you go online and say, you know, Alexa, Siri, Cortana, anyone, Chat GPT. Find me a clinical trial, right? So, and then you just、right. simply get、right. a solution. Say, okay, I have them for you. This is what you have close to you. You need them right now, or you're not ready for a clinical trial. But we、uh, know once you are ready, then we'll give you an alert, and then you go and get and we'll、right. when the time is right. First of all, thank you for building this product. Second of all, I love it. I, I love the fact that you have taken your passion for helping people. Deal with a very difficult circumstance, which is cancer. I mean, there's, there's, granted, there's thousands of types of cancer that eat our bodies, but as you have worked in trying to solve the one-on-one scenarios, now you're solving a one-on-many scenario, giving people access to a wealth of information that otherwise would not be known to them. I mean, I, I can't imagine every oncologist is on cue about what the latest clinical trials look like. Impossible. But, but you. Are now crossing that gap, and you've now helped what over? How many people have have used your application to find a clinical study? Yes,、yeah, so、uh, combining all the channels, of course, you know the the app, the platform online,、uh, and the call center, we have reached out about over a hundred thousand patients already.、Uh, actually, we are、Jeez. helping about five to seven thousand new patients per month. Um, so、wow. we're pretty busy,、um, and we started in the U.S. and then we expanded. <laughs> now we're in in twelve markets total and and counting. So it's、uh, it's been quite a journey. Wow! I imagine and that's I think fits pretty much with your podcast. Like what things takes to scale <laughs> is part of that. Yeah, yeah, no, hundred percent. No, and so so tell me about that. I mean, 
you went from obviously zero to a hundred thousand plus. What's been your favorite part along that journey? Like what, what's, you know, you've spent so many years in school and now you jump into business and you're like, okay, there's parts of it that you obviously don't like, but what's been your favorite piece of that journey? Well, I think, well, there's, there's of course a lot of things that we love. Uh, one of the first is, you know, kind of fusing uh, technology with healthcare delivery because there's not really a lot of that. Like a lot of technology currently yeah. being developed is uh, more for like billing and EHRs and all that stuff. And that's really not right. as helpful for us. It could be helpful for billing. But so for me to like, okay, let's integrate artificial intelligence. Let's look at how yeah. to connect folks from, you know, we have a, our head product is from Verily. Like, okay, let's just work, come together and how they, you know, we can use that and really combine the minds uh, and get outside of my comfort zone because we as physicians were pretty much, right. you know, set up on what we know, what we can do. So getting those extra boundaries and learning more has been amazing for me. Uh, but of course, the greatest right. satisfaction comes from, you know, uh, as we get, you know, we started with like, you know, a hundred patients and then, you know, a thousand and then 10,000 and it's like, wow, like just, just going up, up, up. Uh, and knowing that each right. one of them is a unique cancer patient that we are giving them the chance to really understand you know, better options, even if we cannot really interfere the whole process, but make it much easier. Uh, to me, that looking at the scale that we can actually help millions if we make it right. Uh, it's kind of like the adrenaline right. kind of that like gives us the, the you know, the, the totally. impetus every day. <laughs> no, totally. I, I absolutely love it. You know, I, I had a, I told you prior to the show, but I had a grandfather um, die of a, a testicular cancer that was misdiagnosed. And had he, you know, and I just think of all the all the patients who get either a late diagnosis or a misdiagnosis, and then they come to this point where they're like, "I'm at a very high stage of cancer right now, and is there anything we can try?" You know, you provide that hope for them. You provide that that channel that says, "You know what? There's a study going on right now where they're looking for a higher stage." You know, they may be looking for for trial patients who have those attributes that they have. And you're connecting them in a way that that uh, gives them another layer of hope, which is what all cancer patients want, right? Absolutely. I mean, I, that's uh, I try to put that into like our every single day we're doing something is like, how can we make it better, easier? Uh, how can we find the biomarker that was missing that may have been missed because you know maybe it was tested elsewhere or no, no one paid attention to that result or you know, something got lost I love and, it. and now there's a trial happening to be matching to that biomarker that you currently have, but before it was irrelevant. Crazy. So if we don't have technology to help Crazy. us with that, I mean, I won't have any memory. Yeah. I, I don't know the results of my, you know, what we call a variance of non-significance for my patient who was tested two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, we need a system to give us the alert and then kind of activate the process and, and do it automatically. So that's what we're trying every day. That's so cool. Now I got to ask, because you said you're in 12 different markets. Uh, obviously the US has a lot of restrictions on, on certain clinical trials that could be done within the US that could be done outside the US. Uh, are you finding that, are, are, you, are you drawing a border as to these clinical trials are only for US people and these ones are for people that are outside the US? I mean, are you finding the connectivity between a US patient, for example, who may find a treatment in Mexico or maybe South America somewhere that they're willing to to try more clinical trials on things that aren't FDA approved, things like yeah, that? Yeah, well, that's something that, you know, puzzled me in a way that is that interestingly, every single sponsor of pharma, they have a study open in the US. It's rare that they have it elsewhere. And here in the US, we have the biggest problem in finding those patients. So we have so many options and opportunities and we just don't really take advantage of that. The, the rationale for us to expand outside of the U.S. was because these studies became global, but they always had yeah. U.S. So it's, it's kind of like, what is this paradox, right? We had so much opportunity, but there was not really an, a, a real connection. So, um, but we had patients that actually have moved across. I mean, particularly pediatric patients that have cancer in outside of the United States that, you know, right. St. Jude and CHOP, they're, they're, they're very, you know, dedicated Boston children's. We are helping those patients yeah. to come to the U.S. Uh, to get treatment. I well. love it. I love it. So inspiring. So cool. Um, I just, I love your mission. I love everything about what you're doing. Now, t tell me though, like on the business level, 
there are some roadblocks. There's the challenges that we hit. What's been your biggest roadblock that you've hit in trying to grow and scale this business? Wow, well, uh, there's so many of them. <laughs> but as you can imagine, this is like, wow. Um, well, I think that one of, the, one of the first things is that no one really realized how ripe for disruption the space was, right? So because yeah. the system just moves along and if there was no one in the space trying to fix it, it will still work the same way, right? It's just, you know, same processes. So for us, it was kind of like waking people up and it's like, hey, there's actually a way to make this easier. Yeah. Uh, and, and and talking to different stakeholders to kind of get them all together. So uh, we had to talk to not yeah. just the patients, but, you know, the, the primary oncologists. So they feel that this is a benefit or there's like, oh, I refer a lot of patients. It's like, no, we analyze actually with data and you only refer one patient every thousand patients that you see. Right. So, and, yeah. and now we had the analytics to look at that and saying, you know, why are the CROs opening the same places for clinical trials when we can look at the data of the whole United States and see that there is, you know, deserts of clinical trials with oases of patients that we can just simply activate with just in time capabilities. Uh, so, well, I would, Im yeah, I, I would imagine too, though, that you probably also have the case where someone's running a trial and they see an overload of patients that need maybe a slight deviation from what they might've been looking for and said, you know what, well, let's try it on these people. Uh, does that happen as well? Yeah, and sometimes we tell them, like we look at the protocol and say, by the way, you need to make this tweak because this is going to improve your yeah. by analytics by like, you know, 20% your enrollment in a, in, a, in just a month. And, and wow. they're paying attention now. Wow. So I think that, that the toughest roadblock was just to get ourselves in front of them. And also because we, you know, I think we're in a scale up mode now, but when we were at a startup, yeah. we had to go and sit down yeah. and have like the meeting with this stakeholder that wasn't the right decision maker. And then we have to wait two weeks to get the meeting with the next one. And they say, oh no, let's wait until this. So it's always this, you know, you had to hustle almost and be persistent. Otherwise, they yeah. will not pay attention to you. And then you have to show the numbers. So it's like the chicken and egg situation. So the biggest challenge was, right. was like, hey, this is the value prop. And by the way, this is how we can fix it and give us a chance. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it was just a process. It's, it's, uh, it's still evolving, of course. Uh, but I think we finally found the model that was able to, you know, make it to it. what we're right now, which which is like, you know, 27 different pharma and CRO companies that work with us. I love it. That is so awesome. That, that is really awesome. I honestly, like, I, I just, my heart is swelling within me because I think what you're doing, your mission, your your vision of where you're going with it is just so incredible. It's impacting so many families. I, I don't know anybody that doesn't know somebody that has had to deal with a cancer of some sort. And uh, some people beat it, some people don't. And, uh, you know, it, it's just amazing the work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Now, as, as you look out, though, and as you've been on this journey and, and you see other people trying to break into it could be medical, it could be something similar where they're just trying to get that adoption from both the referrer side and the, and the client side. What advice do you give people dealing with that, making that connection in their business? Uh, well, the first one is, you know, don't be afraid of talking to the, you know, the big guys or big girls there, right? You just go there sit right. down and ask the tough questions. So they need to see that you actually know what you're talking about and what is the problem right. you're trying to solve. So if you don't go bold, they will not understand that yeah. you're really passionate about this. The second one right. is networking. Try to find who knows right. that person and not just through like random LinkedIn requests. Just go to the meeting, sit down, ask questions and get them to, uh, you know, to know you to some extent and, and know who interviews them. So just go, you know, talk to, you know, Matthew Herfer or anyone in the space and say, oh, by the way, do you think we'll be the right person to talk to in for this specific? And they can give you direction. So folks who cover in the journalist right. uh, side, they're great resources in terms of knowledge of who you talk to um, and, and kind of get, getting to know them to at least see where you can help them, right? Because the thing is, many times Love we just it. come and say, this is what I do and this is how we do it. And this is how we're gonna disrupt the space, but they don't see it as a problem that we're trying to solve for them. You always have right. to do the due diligence. Uh, I know it sounds kind of like counterintuitive, like obviously that's the way everyone does, but most people don't. Like they just have to read the room. You're right. <laughs> and take it from you. No, you're right. <laughs> you're right. Most people don't do that. No, I, I think it's a very well said. I, 
you know, it, it's interesting and in, in growing and scaling a, a product, you know, launching, launching is interesting because you're, you're kind of all over the place. You may have, you may have different ideas, different directions you want to go, but it's finding that channel that actually is listening and, and, and consistently repeating that process of acquiring new refers, new clients, new patients, you know, making that connection. Yours is a particularly hard use case because you are trying to market to two different people. And, and you're trying to connect two, two ends, probably three actually, because you also got the clinical trial providers, providers. You're trying to adapt three people, three groups of people into your product. Most people don't have that hard of a challenge. So, so the fact that you've got 100,000 active you know, uh, people that you've been able to help is amazing. I can only guess that being on shows like this and putting yourself out there a little bit more is going to bring more awareness more people to buy into your product. Um, just fascinating. It, what an exciting journey. No, thank you. Very and awesome. I appreciate that you're opportunity to do that. So, and, and sometimes as you're mentioning, clearly like uh, some folks think that, you know, when you're doing things in healthcare, they're service oriented and they, it becomes less sexy, right? But when you yeah. show them like, you know, what's the difference between an Uber or Instacart or, you know, Airbnb considered being tech, when you're actually doing the same, right. the difference here is that you're not getting the patient, like the, the, the person to move from one place to the other for just, you know, going to the airport or getting groceries. This yeah. is to get, a, you know, a potential life-saving treatment uh, using technology. Right. So there's no difference on that end, but right. people need to like kind of realize that as, oh, by the way, you can do this, you know, end-to-end -end analytics and do the heaven of Uber, looking at everyday ride shares totally. and, and cars, but with clinical trials and, you know, providers and individuals. I love it. Now, now tell me, as you, as you hit roadblocks, as you hit these challenges, uh, there's always somebody there that you're looking at that you're like, oh my gosh, this person is an inspiration to me. I would love to hear a shout out of one or two people that you have in your path that have kind of guided you through those challenges and, and kind of helped mentor you through them. Who are they? Uh, well, so many on different things, but I mean, I feel one of them that I'm um, inspired and I have to give the kudos to the most uh, is my co-founder, Celine. So she, awesome. she is uh, a very, very, you know, a strong will, powerful person who like very humble, but extremely smart. She, yeah. you know, like she has like, four engineering degrees, PhD, work at Ernst & Young. She created this whole program <laughs> and just decided to come with this crazy journey with me because she really believed in the mission and, and did it for her, yeah, for her own family's sake. Um, Love and, it. and so we really rely on each other to, you know, take it every single day when we have a challenge. And, and I have learned so much from her on the business side. And I, and now she's also almost like a honorary oncologist as well, uh, by, by working with me. <laughs> honorary oncologist. Yeah. I almost give her like the, the degree, uh, but, uh, it's, uh, That's awesome. it's, uh, it's, a you know, someone that I really, uh, look after and in, in times of need, we help each other. Like we're kind of like supportive with each other. I love it. Um, I love so it. So that, that I think that's probably one of the, the, the biggest uh, folks that I actually follow and, and so passionate about. Yeah. I love it. Hey, I'll always take a co-founder shout out. That's a that's a great one to have. And uh, I, I hope that you guys are, are continued with, with uh, many blessings of success for the good work that you're doing and for the people you're trying to help. I just can't think of a better mission. And uh, I hope that I hope that you grow and scale to the, to the end of the world. I mean, this is just an amazing problem you're helping solve. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you guys that are listening, this has not only been a, a very um, mission-driven podcast episode, but this is also, there's a lot of nuggets of good information in here about growth and scaling into different verticals, into uh, a multifaceted approach of marketing where you're trying to attract three different types of, of people into the product. Fascinating. I love it. How do people follow you? Where, where are you most active? Are you active on social media at all? Uh, yeah, I'm quite active. So on Twitter it is at DR, DR Bonilla Onk, like Dr. Bonilla Onk. 
Uh, also LinkedIn, that... you can find me. I'm the only Arturo Loaiza Bonilla in the whole world. So, Woo. so you can actually love it. And I'm the only Arturo oncologist in the whole United States. So it's not even really hard <laughs> to find, right? So <laughs> <laughs> you're 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 lucky that way. Yes, that's, that's so it. cool. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll put the links down below in the show notes. So those of you listening, don't hesitate to click on him, follow him. I notice he's got a, a much bigger following on LinkedIn than any other doctor I've ever seen. Uh, so very, very cool stuff. He must be putting out a lot of great content and a lot of good stuff out there. So thanks for all you do. And please join us on the next episode of the Growth and Scaling Podcast. Thanks for being here. Take care, everyone. Was it as cool as I thought it was? I don't know about you, but that interview was uh, was touching to me. It was uh, inspiring to me uh, from both the business aspect as well as the transition from a professional service provider uh, in the medical field into being a business founder and owner. That is not a common play. And uh, this this man has done it with, with grace. I think that he's a, as an amazing intellectual, an amazing practitioner, and a great business owner, founder. So I know that I found some inspiring moments in this interview. I hope that you did too. If you know people that need to hear more about uh, this interview and the, and the things that he touched upon, don't hesitate to share it. There's a share button on every podcast listener that you could be listening to this on. And of course on YouTube, just share the link, like and subscribe. And if you uh, haven't done so already, listen to some of the other episodes. This podcast is inspiring. It's, uh, it uh, gives you all the information you need to know to learn the lessons of growth and scaling from people who have been there and done it. So thank you so much for being a part of the show today. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. 